you, did you enjoy yourself? I thought that was quite interesting, right? I expected it to be quite boring, right? so I prepared questions to ask them. But right now, uh, Mike is going to pass out the uh, evolution and uh, uh, intelligent design slips of paper again just to see if, if they manage to sway anyone. In the meantime, we'll, uh, we'll take some questions from the floor. And uh, there's only one mic on my side. We are going to take three questions in succession uh, at random. Uh, just, just come up to the front and if it's directed to whoever, just say whether it's directed to them or both or whoever. And please write down the, your own questions because they'll ask three in succession. And then you just answer whatever, whatever comes up. Okay? Can I do the opposite? Can I summarize what you said in a different way? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm good at that. So, there's, there seems to be two fundamental differences. One is the, uh, the, the view of ignorance, in particular. First order ignorance is what you know that you don't know. Like, before we came here, maybe we didn't know, but we know that we didn't know. No, we know. Okay, the second order of uh, ignorance is things that you don't know that you don't know. And I think the IT team says there might be things that we don't know that we don't know that might influence evolution, correct? And the second team says, no, from the point of view of naturalism, there's no things that we don't know that we don't know. From within the system, we can know everything, and therefore, that, that's, our, that's the point of view. So that's the first difference. Would you agree? I that's, say, that's like a core difference. I would say we know everything, but we can know. But you can know. Ah, see, that. Ah, because that's the difference. Right. So the second thing comes to do with uh, thermodynamics and the, the, the problem of entropy in physical uh, in any reaction. And the difference here is that here, uh, randomness can uh, explain how cells can come about. And in the other, they say that no, randomness is not enough because there are things that we don't know that we don't know about. And that would probabilistically be more influential than randomness. That's the second difference. So the question is this. Let's say, so, now, now, so that's just describing what they just said in, in two minutes. Uh, the question is this, let's say uh, that your view is correct, and we are here now, and it's all evolution, then in like a couple of thousand years, we make a spaceship, and we go to another star, and we genetically, we engineer the whole planet, then a few billion years later, they, have, they sit in a room like this, and have a discussion about evolution and intelligent design. Um, which one is true? Chicken or the because egg. then you have intelligence designing everything on the planet, but then again, that intelligence came from evolution, or did it, and so on. That's, that's the question. Okay, um, if, if, it's basically for me, this, the, the movie. Right, come, come. Second, second question, please. Um, I just want to say to the I team, because you, you mentioned many times that um, intelligence cannot come from non-intelligence, right? So, um, you said that the other team did not um, prove that um, intelligence can come from non-intelligence. But I think the burden of proof is on you. Okay. Mine is a similar question to his. Uh, you said intelligence has to be borrowed, it has to have a source. So let's take this a step further and say, where does God's intelligence come from? <laughs> okay. So, who would like to go first? If that was a question that you answered. Okay, sure. Um, I think it would be extremely cool if aliens from Prometheus designed this. <laughs> um, no, uh, but, but, but yeah, what you talked about was abiogenesis, whether or not the, the first life form was true intelligence. Um, currently, we don't know that yet, but evolution so far as we can determine is a completely natural process as far as we can know. Whether or not abiogenesis was happened through external factors, there are some theories that suggest that the first, the first life forms actually came in the meteor or in hit earth, you know. We, we don't know yet, there could be many other explanations but, uh, and definitely uh, intelligence f forming 
the origin of life is not completely out of the question yet because the consensus on abiogenesis is still ongoing. They have not completely figured out everything yet. Uh, and so this is a question that's very open right now. Science is discovering all avenues. But personally, I don't think that it will be an intelligent um, designer like, um, like 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 a supreme being intelligent designer. Wait, wait, wait. But, my uh, yeah, I know. But uh, like yeah. people like us are it, 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 Yeah, it, it might be. It, it might be. I know, I'm just saying it, it, it's possible. It, it might be. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking about my personal view. My personal view is that I don't think that there is a being, I don't think that there is the aliens that created us because there we don't have we don't see any evidence for any other species being here besides us. I mean other intelligent species being here besides us. But then again there is a possibility that there might be some, so we don't know. Like currently I, I would say is that we don't know, but I don't think so. Um just may, may I say something? Uh, um he addressed uh, I mean he talked about a biogenesis, which is not what evolution actually I mean, yeah which is not relevant to evolution because evolution describes the diversity of species and he touched on faith and I would like to say that in about 2007-2009, I forgot which year um, the, the Pope, he actually said that there's no clash between evolution as scientists know it and faith so, in a, uh, so it, uh, it has been mentioned by even Richard Dawkins that the church, the Catholic Church endorses evolution and they have they even encourage classes. Although I, I have to admit that a lot of the the common the common man, even you know your I'm sure maybe there are Catholics in here who don't um, accept evolution, there are, but I'm just saying that it is I, I personally feel that it's not mutually exclusive because you, because you're talk, if, if you accept evolution, you could say that maybe God sparked that single cell. You know, why not? It's a personal viewpoint. Lah, and I, I just want to say that evolution does not necessarily have to exclude faith. That's all. Um, sorry, going back to Prometheus, if that was your example. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, in Prometheus, the movie, it's like, um, even though they spark the origin of life, it seems like they somehow left behind um, um, some sort of function that would cause purpose in evolution, which is why humans developed and have a similar DNA structure with the aliens they later find. That is definitely not true because we, we can tell that there is no um, overriding purpose behind evolution. But again, whether or not some alien species spark life, we don't know. Okay, um, I, intelligent design team. I just, uh, I just want to just qualify something. Uh, it's not that we, we are not appealing to ignorance here. It is not that we say we don't know what caused it. There must be something we don't know what it is. That's not, that's not really the gist of the argument. The point we are trying to make here is we understand, number one, we understand there is a cause and effect structure of the universe where things, effects, are contingent upon a greater cause. Or a cause, rather. So, when 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 you bring the thing, when you when you bring a question like, uh, you know, if let's say aliens, you know, did did did, you know, put plant the pause and you know whatever to allow, uh, you know, life to, to to evolve and so forth, it would lead back to the bigger question of how did they come about again through evolution. You have to come back to the first cause. What is the first cause? And I know it's not part of our our talk today. But the big question here is why do we have something rather than nothing? So and when you understand that, I, I, that's not where we're talking. But my point is, based on our understanding of the cause and effect structure of the universe, we understand there is intelligence, and where there is intelligence, there is an intelligent cause. That, that, that's the point of intelligent design. Um, uh, the last question, which is very interesting. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually the, uh, another version of the one. If God created us, who created God? La? <laughs> you know, like we just turn, throw in the intelligence uh, as, as a what. La. But actually, it is a moot question in the sense that if there's somebody who created God, la, or, or the intelligence that is created God's intelligence, la, then he won't be God anymore. It's by definition, you know, that in the beginning he was just there. Uh, and we, we, even if there is one who created him, uh, we cannot find out because it's one stage removed from us already. You see? Uh, so, so it's a moot question. Okay, any more questions before? From different people, please. So, come and line up, yeah? Uh, come and line up, yeah? Okay. Yes, good. Okay. 
I suppose to argue for against intelligent desire to argue. Ask the question. Okay. <laughs> that is not it's not intelligent at all. So number one, uh, just like you said about the sickle cell anemia, which is a very good case. Now we know that the, we know how the genes are, are the alleles are being inherited. Now he hasn't give a bigger picture. What happened is that there are quarters. You can divide the population into quarters into four. Now, one part will be normal, homozygous normal. One part, sorry, two parts will be uh, heterozygous. Means they have a normal gene for your red blood cell, and then they have 50% of sickle cell. That's the one that has a fitness to go, sorry, to survive malaria. But what about the last one quarter? They are little. Why must you say that it's intelligent if one quarter has to suffer? Can you come up with a better solution, like better antibodies, better resistance against malaria? So that's number one. Number two, talking about DNA, DNA is not a perfect code. It's the replication of DNA is full with uh, errors. In fact, we have a number for that. One times 10 to the power minus seven. For every replication of DNA polymerase, there is an error. And if you do not have the uh, proofreading part of the uh, polar enzymes, then you can't correct your DNA and your mutation get passed down. Now, before DNA, there's even RNA. RNA is even worse. Okay? That's how your HIV can evade your drug. Uh, any drugs are recruited. So, but again, RNA viruses, they are much more better than us. So, if you say it's directed, and we are the optimal for it, I mean, so called not optimal for us to say, but then they are better, they are much more creatures that are better than us. Okay? Now, I really want to know your definition. I will say that in the end, evolution is just about reproductive success. That's all. You can reproduce, that's the end, no matter what, by hook or by crook. It's something like Machiavellian uh, mechanism or something like that. That anything that you have, any mutations, any variations, if you have a slight advantage of uh, reproductive success, you can pass down your gene, you get being passed down. That's all. It's very simple. And talking about being away, like Jin Fang say, um, in another planet, we have genetic drift. And also, what we call it, uh, what was that term? Small population, where you get random drift of alleles. When we come back, you will be a different species again. So, we can't. So what's okay. your only question do you want? <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a question because I'm also a genetic student from UM. <laughs> now, the thing is that about the, the, the thing is, that is how intelligent, intelligent it is whereby we have an entertainment organ, organ <laughs> entertainment that is near the super center. You urinate and you reproduce with the same organ for meals. Yeah, and, and that, that particular is the one quarter population that has to suffer from homozygous recessiveness. That's very bad. That's not intelligent at all. They have to come up with it. That's all. Okay, come on more. Okay, my question is regards to naturalism because I think that what the debate today boils down to, um, I think um, the this is towards the uh, intelligent design side. Um, since there seems to be a perception that science uh, intentionally moves towards naturalism, actually science uh, didn't actually come out from the naturalism side. Um, it just so happens that if you sit around long enough to wait for something amazing to happen, something out of the ordinary or something supernatural to happen, it does not. That is why at the end of the day, when you're trying to predict or explain events, you end up with a generally naturalistic um, bent. So, um, there is a question to this. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the, the, the whole idea behind evolution is being that, given that there's this entire body of evidence that points to uh, even macroevolution, um, then at the end of the day, if um, you, you keep saying that it's not an argument from ignorance, but you, uh, the only question you're asking is, um, how can uh, inorganic material or you know nothing uh, become intelligent or normal materials which are not intelligent becomes intelligent? Then doesn't that make intelligent design basically not science? Because science is supposed to be something which uh, actually 
uh, explains how something happens. You know, so if we're talking about science and um, because this is an evolution versus intelligent design, and intelligent design um, always attempts to disguise itself as a form of science, uh, which has been struck down in, in courts and stuff like that for precisely for being not science. Right, so at the end of the day, science doesn't claim to, to know everything, it doesn't claim to have all the answers immediately. But doesn't but doesn't that mean that since intelligent design doesn't provide an explanation after all, um, it just alludes to okay, this you know, if you see all these things, it seems like there's a design, but there's no a particular logical path that you can follow from it. There's, there's no evidence, there's no, no cause and effect like the one which you put up yourself. Then doesn't that make intelligent design not science at all? Okay, one more. Okay, so everyone seems to be asking questions for one side. I thought I'd do something different. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, both of you can respond. So, okay. <laughs> okay, basically, this is my. You know, whenever I look at something, uh, theories basically, that explain anything, uh, there are a few things that I look at, you know, to judge how good those theories are. One thing is the predictive quality of the theory. So can both sides please tell me what your theory basically is uh, capable of offering to us in terms of its predictive ability, what it can predict and what it can You know, because there's, there's no point uh, having a theory that doesn't tell you, you know, having any predictive power because you can't use it for anything. Uh, number two is uh, what has your theory contributed basically to anything science, understanding, uh, in terms of practical uses, non practical uses, anything? You can just give us a few examples of what your theory uh, respectively has uh, provided. You know? And number three is uh, one more thing that I always look at is if you present an argument or a theory, it needs to be falsifiable. So can you please show how your theory, if it is wrong, how it can be proven to be wrong. So if you can prove that it is wrong, maybe in another way of looking at it is, uh, if you can't prove that it is wrong, so... <laughs> the first one is more of a statement, so just ignore him. Really, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you were saying that you know you're talking about the cause and effect uh, thing, and basically it's not science, right? Is this is this what was that what you're saying? Correctly, if I'm wrong. No. Uh, no, like like um, you you say that naturalism is insufficient. Um, there has to be an explanation for something that that causes evolution to happen or something like that. So um, that that is not that is not science. That is not um, science looks for patterns or facts or data in order to you know form a theory. So just saying that something must have caused it is not science. Mm, okay, you, you 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 for me science is basically observing things. Uh, it's basically an observation of things, and like I keep repeating, I, I I know I'm repeating myself again and again and again, but we I observe. For example, you mentioned patterns. I observe again and again that you know there is cause and effect structures you know we have basically everything is contingent upon another cause so when based on that i don't see i mean basically i don't see why you would call it not science if let's say i observe read into the thing and just say basically this is intelligent there is no intelligent source for it there has to be an intelligent cause for it i really don't understand why that would not be considered to be science it's observation okay to, to phrase it a different way like a guy a tribal guy sitting around a campfire like maybe 10,000 years ago, when he sees the sun rise, there's two types of person. A scientist would say, we don't know why the science rise, because at that time, we don't have that knowledge yet. The other guy, uh, who's the village shaman, would say, that is your god, you know, rising in the sun. So, um, in, in either one way, whether, whether you are open-minded to it or not, if you're the guy who is uh, claiming to have an explanation for it, or to say that there must be some kind of design or, or some force that lifts the sun up, now we know it's gravity. But if you're, if you're the guy who claims that there must be some force to go it out, instead of saying, I don't know. Because science's answer to that is, I don't know. See, and so, or, or if you can find a natural pattern. That, that's why, going back to naturalism, the reason why naturalism is predominant in science is because that's what we observe. If you take out your phone and you turn it on, it turns on. We don't wait for some other force to miraculously turn it on, <coughs> otherwise the phone won't work at all. So, in, in a sense, you're saying that there must be some miraculous force which causes things to happen. That's not science, that's what I'm saying. That was, I think that was a statement, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs>
It's very interesting. I think you have read this book before because there's there's actually a two paragraphs here which addresses the possibility, uh, force, falsifiability and predictability. Let me just read it out. Falsifiability has proven problematic as a criterion for identifying signs. According to this criterion, uh, theory is scientific if there are empirical grounds on which it can be falsified. Falsification, however, turns out to be difficult and in many cases impossible to achieve. As philosopher of science Elliot Sober has noted, a scientific theory invariably requires auxiliary assumptions to bring it in touch with observation. This always leaves open the possibility that the auxiliary assumptions and not the scientific theory itself are responsible for a putative falsification. Similar observations hold for verifiability since auxiliary assumptions may show up a theory that is false. So sometimes what we see at, that is used as a proof for something uh, 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 it may actually lead us down the, the wrong way, uh, the falsification. Then predictability is equally problematic. Many scientific theories attempt not so much to predict the future as to reconstruct the past. For example, archaeology and anthropology. Theories about evolution of life, for instance, are mainly concerned with reconstructing the past. They do, in a weak sense, predict what one should find in the fossil record. But predictions of this sort are often impossible to confirm since, as evolutionary paleontologists are quick to note, the absence of evidence is no evidence of absence. The requirement that a scientific theory must provide a causal mechanism is simply false. Newton's universal law of gravitation was no less a scientific theory because Newton failed, indeed refused to postulate a mechanism for the regular pattern of attraction that his law described. So too the claim that intelligent design has no problem solving capability is false. Intelligent design solves many problems in biology. The question is not whether intelligent design has problem solving capability but whether its solutions are valid. The validity of those solutions forms a legitimate subject for the debate, but it is a scientific, not a religious debate. And so when we tested all the violins and all this, uh, we have not, up to today, been able to reproduce a Stradivarius violin, you see. So, but that doesn't mean that we can deny that there is a Stradivarius who made violin of that quality in the past, because we have the the effect man, is, is, is with us. Man. So what it is saying is that you need not always be able to explain something uh, to know that it exists. You see? And in fact, what he puts that, push it further is that therefore it is an area of research if we can just admit that you know there is such a thing that was created by this genius and we don't know how he did it. Now our research is because we believe that it was designed by that, that genius of following certain ways, uh, we will use that as our path of scientific research. That's the, the application uh, of intelligence design. That's what, what he says. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, now, if, uh, on, with regards to contribution, I do know that there is a scientist called Jonathan Wells from the Discovery Institute. He is doing research 